Well, it, it, very helpful to know that, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes, it's, I've been at this for a while. Um, I was 18 years old when I took a course called the Silver Method. And I know there are a few folks on the, uh, on the screen here who are uh, familiar with the Silver Method and even teach it. And I, when I was 18 years old and I had this experience, it was really life changing for me. And I got very, very curious about things and uh, mind of the area of mind development. And I became quite an avid reader. Up until then, I did very little reading. Uh, I was not at all interested in reading, quite frankly, in my grade school and even high school years. When I hit 18 and I, I, I found out about the Silva method and the power of uh, our consciousness, I became quite the avid reader and couldn't take in enough of things about mind development, uh, emotional intelligence, some esoteric stuff, and spirituality, spiritual practices. And it's just uh, the, you know, the way that I've lived all these many years and so much uh, curiosity about human behavior, particularly my own, quite frankly. <laughs> and I think uh, most people that have been in the spiritual development area or the uh, uh, coaching area or personal development area really often step into it because they're curious about themselves, really. And then they, they find helpful ways and are drawn to helping others. So this is uh, not uncommon. So the Silva Method opened it up for me. I'm still a big fan. Uh, there are some people like Wayne Dyer, uh, Jack Canfield, a um, whole, whole host of people who have taken the Silva Method and have been encouraged taking their courses. And I'm right along with that. Now, when it was around 1998 that I made the, this transition full-time to coaching, Although a good 10 years before that, I found myself doing a fair amount of coaching with my uh, business owner clients when I was in the financial field. So that's uh, essentially uh, wanting to expand to the whole, whole life of the individual. And that's what, uh, what I found coaching offered me the opportunity to do that. So today uh, is all about you. I'll be happy to be your facilitator. Um, a kind of orient uh, things for you. Anything I say is uh, you can accept or reject, feel free. I'm not in the business of, of encouraging anyone to believe anything other than believing within themselves and really feeling good about their own belief system. So I'll share some of the things that uh, I personally believe with no intention of uh, imposing those beliefs on you in any way at all. I'm here to be helpful. And the objective is to create a meaningful intention statement. Uh, it's a draft, I'll, I'll say, uh, an ongoing conversation with your soul. And uh, there may be some time to go into some other areas, but that's the main focal point for today. The objective of to create a meaningful intention statement that's filled with passion, purpose, love, and benefits for all and when today's session is done, you'll have the opportunity to continue that conversation with your soul just as long as you like. So I'm gonna uh, use a little screen share here. And I want you, uh, Judy, Cindy, to feel free to interrupt at any time. And, um, I'll, uh, and there'll be no interruption at all. If there are comments or questions, happy to uh, engage it during the process, because if someone has something on their mind that is distracting them from moving forward, we don't want that. We want to keep people, you know, really in the process. So any uh, questions or comments that are helpful to that end, well, I'm helpful, very uh, happy to field those. So, um, any questions or comments before uh, I uh, move in that direction? I just want to remind people because some people jumped on while you started talking to get a pen and paper. I know we keep saying that, but mm -hmm. five on after you started talking. So make sure everybody has pen and paper or pencil and paper. Yes. Yeah. It's on my checklist too, Jude. <laughs> That's right. Because this is um, certainly something that 
but to be able to walk away with this very powerful statement and to continue to uh, play with it, as I like to say, uh, it's definitely helpful to jot things down. And I'll make particular, uh, I'll give particular attention to what it is that I, I encourage to be written as we go here. So let's see. Let's see how this works now. I believe I can get right on over to here. And is that a full screen for you folks? That you see this slide in the full screen? It is, yep. All righty, and then I think I can hop over here myself. So, all right. So what do you want to create? That's the question. And together, uh, we're going to create these, uh, what I call intention statements. And um, an intention statement, uh, we'll, we'll, you'll see, is very different from a goal. In intentions can be uh, really in any area of life. And we typically think of intentions in the areas of our health and wellness, or our career and finance or perhaps our relationships, I definitely want you to consider the inner aspects of yourself here. It's a very fine intention to ask yourself how you want to feel or what you need to believe to create the kind of life that you want or uh, an intention to develop your intuition or perhaps an intention to develop more uh, self-awareness uh, within yourself or a spiritual connection, whatever the case may be, it's not limited to the objective world of health and wellness, career, finance, and relationships, but virtually everything. And that really does speak to the fact that we do have more to ourselves than just the subjective world. There's a subjective world of our experience, and much of what we see in our outer world is a reflection of what we're seeing from our inner world. So uh, feel free to create intentions in any way you'd like, but keep those in mind as well. Uh, I think our, uh, you know, we want you to um, be certain that you create what you want, uh, not what uh, your family and friends uh, think you should be or what you should be doing or what society thinks you should be or who you should be. We want to focus on what you want and to get that information from your soul. And we'll explain that in a brief moment. Now, of course, uh, we could start creating at any time. Anytime we want, we could start creating. Um, we, here we are uh, in the rhythm of the new year. So we could put our attention on what we'd like to see happen in uh, 2021. But just the same, we can uh, think in terms of uh, intentions, in terms of uh, any time frame at all. It could be a time frame of what we do in the 90 day game, of course, over a 90 day period. We can also uh, set intentions anytime for the, our given day. So whatever it is, the point I'm making here is that we wanna use the calendar or I should say, I want to use the calendar. I don't want the calendar to use me. And sometimes we get very structured into, I got to get this uh, goal accomplished. I have to have it over a certain time. And this is not the orientation uh, that I'm bringing today. So I say personally, I don't want to be used by the calendar. I want to make use of the calendar to facilitate what it is that I want in my life. And so I offer you the opportunity to consider that kind of thinking. So again, today it's gonna to be very highly interactive. We'll go through a process, but we do wanna interact. So uh, you know, Cindy and Judy and anyone has a comment, uh, feel free to, be, to jump in. Uh, the emphasis today is on you. Uh, and as much as we're interacting, interacting with each other, we really want to get into a place where you'll be interacting with your soul. So as it's been said many times before, <laughs> if you want to get a 
pen in hand, pencil in hand, something to jot things down, because there'll be some very specific questions that I'd like you to respond to. And so we'll do, as Cindy said, the right thing, the W uh, version of right, W-R-I-T-E, do the right thing. And that's, uh, that's it. Three steps to manifestation. There are really only three things that we focus on in the 90 day game over a 90 day period. And there are really only three of them. A clarity of intent, then directing attention on your intention, and then navigating the inevitable peaks and valleys that life offers us. Now, you know, I said earlier, I just wake up each day joyous that I have this gift of life in, in, in front of me. And I recognize that I don't control things. Uh, there is meaningful contrast in life. And I want to celebrate all of it. So when challenges show up, we want to be able to embrace the challenges and look at them not as good or bad, right or wrong, but as valuable guidance information. Because sometimes when we perceive something's not going in the direction that we intended, there may be a reason for it. So I'd like us all to keep that in mind. So there's only three things. There's a clear intent. Then there's directing attention on your intention and then navigating the peaks and valleys. Now, we have what I refer to as four resources. And I alluded to, alluded to this before, we have a soul aspect. It's where our deepest urges are coming from. We're emotional human beings. We feel. And the feelings that we have are really meanings we're assigning to our emotions. So that's something we might talk a little bit about more later. We also have a mental life. Uh, thoughts are happening all the time. The environment around us is causing us to have, be sensitive to other th thoughts. And of course, uh, the most obvious thing of our four resources is this physical body we have that helps us navigate our experiences on the planet, move us about, carry our soul, if you will, around the planet. And so these are the four resources we have and they're beautiful gifts. And we want to, again, similar to the calendar, I like the idea of using uh, our emotions rather than being used by them to use our thoughts rather than be used by our thoughts. And when we have this alignment of clear intent coming from our soul and it's resonating emotionally in alignment with our soul's intent and our thoughts and beliefs are in alignment with our intent, we tend to behave in alignment and manifest the things that we want to create rather quickly into our lives. So these are four blessed resources. And sometimes we might uh, hear others say, or ourselves, I'm too emotional, or um, I've got a lot of negative thinking. And these are all meanings we're assigning to things. These are resources we can make great use of. And when they are off course, it's an invitation to align them back with intent. But of course, if we have an established intent, then how do we realign ourselves to feel the way we choose to feel or realign ourselves with the kinds of thoughts that uh, we uh, serve us and the beliefs that serve us? We establishing intent allows for, uh, for this to, uh, you know, for us to uh, experience life in this way. So these are the four resources and this may be a good thing to jot down because I'll be referring to these four resources regularly throughout uh, our conversation here. Soul, emotion, mind, and behavior. Okay, 
So I'm talking a lot about the soul. And you may be wondering, what do we mean by soul? And I'm happy to open this up in, in, in an interactive way if anyone has any comments of what soul means to them. And I'll be happy to share my sense of it and how um, having an understanding or a language for what the soul is offers us the opportunity to be able to have conversation with it. So I don't know if any thoughts have come up from uh, our uh, moderators here or from the, the chat box, but I'd be happy to dance over there if there's anything. Nothing's come up, but if anybody wants to unmute and throw uh, what they mean, feel, you know, soul means, feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, go ahead. Anya says, um, is your soul, hold on, let me read it again. Is your soul your higher self? Well, it certainly uh, is and can be and more. Certainly, uh, I would say that that is, uh, that is the case. Yeah. It's good to think about when you think about what your soul is. And, you know, I'll have a lot of ideas to share, but again, what's most important is where you are in your own orientation within yourself. So, I'll hop back over here. All right. So, your soul, well, I can look at these four aspects this way. Behavior is the most obvious thing, our bodies, right? And then we go a little bit more internally, we realize we have thoughts and so forth. Uh, they're readily accessible. And we go a little deeper into our emotional state and how we feel. And then there's this deeper level of soul. It's the deepest part of you that is connected to the source of all there is. Now you can call it higher self, you can call it God, the universe, or your creator. But I'd like you to understand this. It could be real for you, or it could be a concept for you. If, if you don't feel that it's something real, still you can have a conversation with your soul in a way where uh, you can cr create some sort of con connection that goes beyond yourself. It's important how you perceive it, not how I do. Your soul knows you better than yourself. Because from my point of view, if I look at the, the soul as the source of all there is, then I know that that which created me knows me better than I know myself. Now, I might have been born perfectly clear on this, but then there's the influences in childhood, parental influences, uh, uh, religious influences, teachers, uh, other family members that might have skewed my own concept of who I am. Maybe I'm thinking I shouldn't be who I am and I should be something else. This is not uncommon. As we go through life, a lot of life experiences happen and we begin to maybe shape a different view of ourselves. Where we were, in my belief system, we were born perfect in every way, designed very beautifully. And I believe the soul knows that blueprint of perfection, why we're here, who we truly are. Uh, my favorite uh, way of looking at the soul is in the form of an acronym. A soul could be, for me, um, the source of unconditional love. And to me, the big soul, the over soul, and we're all connected to that mainframe. That's how I see the soul as the source of unconditional love. 
And there's nothing more powerful than that loving force. And we bring that loving intention into our meaningful intentions that are filled with passion, purpose, love, and benefits for all. So that's my orientation on the soul being the, the mainframe, the source, the thing that connects me to uh, the creator. And I'm not separate from that. That's what's so beautiful about it because we know as we navigate in our individual bodies, we could see separate separation. You're where you are, I'm where I am. But when we get into the deeper layers of ourselves and we understand ourselves as emotional beings, as uh, those who each have a soul, we see a very deep connection that unifies us all. So each and every one of our souls is connected and interconnected and connected to the source of all there is, the source of unconditional love. And that's what I'd like to uh, offer as the opportunity to have a conversation with that part of us who knows our perfection, who knows our blueprint, and could help guide us back home to who we truly are and the perfection of how we were designed. John, I have a, uh, there's a question. Um, how do we connect to this soul consciously? How do we connect with the soul consciously? Well, someone's jumping ahead of my screen share because uh, that's exactly what the next slide is. So I'm gonna jump right back over to that. And hopefully I'm not, this is not too distracting that I'm doing this little dance back and forth. But um, yes. So the next, very next slide. How do you, how do I con converse with my soul? I think that's essentially the question. And so the soul communicates with you all the time. And you wanna become sensitive to that. Because as I mentioned those four aspects before that I suggested or resources that I suggested you write down and I will continue to pull back to, the soul communicates to us through these resources. You have the source of all there is, and then you have four resources. And so the soul communicates through thoughts and inner dialogue and through emotion, feelings. And you, as you become more and more sensitive at being an alert witness to yourself, you'll become aware of, of distinctions between emotions that serve you and emotions that don't serve you. I really call them feelings because it's feelings are what we assign to our emotions. So when we develop this intuition to understand our emotions, we can continually be uh, guided from our soul through our emotions. And this is the power of establishing clear intent because if I've established clear intent, then when I'm having an emotion, I can, uh, or in a feeling, I can see if it aligns with it. When I'm having thoughts, is this thought in alignment with what it is that I'm creating? If it aligns with what I'm creating beautifully, if it's in conflict with it, I wanna bring it back into congruent alignment. Thoughts represent beliefs. And when we're having a conversation with our soul, we're developing an empower, empowering belief structure. And when we're in conflict, we know that the belief that we're entertaining is not aligned with our soul's intent. So the soul communicates with us through our thoughts and through emotion. And we, in turn, communicate back with the soul in developing this lively conversation. The more you develop a relationship with this as a conversation, as, uh, as something that is very real and there and present for you, then you can offer questions and you can be given guidance back if you carry a deep belief 
in what we're talking about and develop a deeper belief. So I want you to not reject emotions of any kind or reject any thoughts of any kind, but to celebrate them all. Because part of the challenge that we face as um, human beings is that we've been conditioned to label things quickly as good or bad. I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling good. And of course I wanna feel good, I don't wanna feel bad. So when I feel bad, I wanna push that away. And what we really want to do is to be with that emotion, be with that feeling. What is it really, how is it informing us in a way that we can make greater use of it? So we're feeling things for a reason. And we shouldn't reject that. We should entertain it, but we shouldn't be controlled by it either. So developing the ability to be an alert witness, to observe our emotions, not quickly label them as good or bad, push some away, embrace others, but entertain it all. I know I'm reminded of the poet uh, Rumi. <laughs> it comes up all the time. Uh, Rumi had this poem, The Guest House. I know Cindy and uh, Judy had someone that's uh, on recently that discussed it, and we have it in the game. Rumi has that spirit of, you know, each morning uh, an unexpected uh, visitor comes to your door, you know, invited in, uh, treated honorably. It, it's a guide from beyond. And it's nothing more appropriate for the kind of spirit that I would like to invite uh, in this conversation. So look at it all as valuable, divine guidance. Not good, not bad, but to understand it all the more deeply. Because our thoughts represent beliefs. Some that serve us and some that maybe we want to uh, develop into more empowering beliefs. And emotions are always informing of us of needs, some that are being met and some that aren't being met. And values that we choose to honor. So if you've jotted down those four things about um, uh, soul, emotion, thought, and behavior, you might want to jot next to emotion that their true value and purpose is helping us identify needs and values. And next to thoughts, um, put beliefs there. Because that's what's, every thought contains a belief. Right now, listening to me and thinking about what I'm saying, you're, you're having a, some sort of belief that says, gee, this is making sense to me, or this uh, guy, Felito, I don't know where he's coming from. <laughs> yeah. But you're having some thought, some belief is being entertained. And it's amazing to recognize that every thought you're having contains some level of belief. So this may um, create uh, a lot of thought for you, <laughs> maybe some questions and comments, if that's the case now or the case later, I'll be happy to discuss it uh, before we'll kind of shift gears into uh, the next uh, slide. Any, anyone have any thoughts, uh, comments to share? Uh, I'll be happy to pause for a moment. Well, I have a comment. Um, yes. You know, as far as the emotions go, it is pretty, crazy because emotions really and you know I'm really learning this the more and more I'm on this path that they've ruled my life and most of them haven't even been like true true to my soul put it that way that you know like fear that's been a big one that has really kind of detoured my life in so many different directions right and uh you know, so I just, is it true when you said, is this true and a value and a purpose? I realized a lot of my emotions were more defects. They were just more, um, you know, coming from a very fearful place. 
you know, of losing control of losing something. I mean, they, it's, it really has come a lot from that. So, you know, I just like how you said, is this true and a value and a purpose? Cause that's really strong to back that up whenever I'm feeling something. You know? Yes, Judy, absolutely. And I, I, I know that most everyone shares what your um, experience is. The aim is again with this invitation is to say, and that she may want to do the right thing <laughs> if it's helpful. Um, when we notice we're in fear, it's an opportunity for us to pull back to intention. It's almost an invitation to say, okay, I'm feeling fearful. Let me pull back to my intention. That's um, the um, uh, fear piece, which and then shows itself in different ways. When I'm doubting, uh, you know, my, doubting myself, it's an opportunity to pull back to faith, faith in myself, faith in something higher, uh, to pu pull back uh, to um, where are my strengths, where are my talents, how does that align with my purpose? So when I'm doubting myself, instead of sitting with the doubt, you know, recognizing it, acknowledging it honoring it, it's an invitation to pull back to, uh, to uh, the faith in yourself, cultivating faith in yourself and something higher. And then there's another one that's worry. And when we're worrying, it's usually about something that might happen. A mental movie of something, it's not happening necessarily now, but worrying inherently is something that's going to happen going Forward. That's a, a mental movie projecting something that I really don't want to happen, that I'm concerned might happen. So um, pull back to the gratitude of the moment, the opportunity to be a creator, that you were given these abilities to create, and you're not creating it alone. You're creating it in alignment with your soul and your source, and you also uh, have other wonderful souls that you can reach to as other resources to create what you want and build further confidence. So what I've just mentioned here in summary is that there's fear, doubt, and worry, and there's love, faith, and gratitude. And so fear, when that shows up, pull back to the loving aspects of your intention. Because when you're in a state of uh, love in the broadest sense and in all senses fear is there's no room for fear when you bring love into the picture because uh, you, you you can't have both really both emotions at the same time so when you're feeling fear acknowledge it what am i afraid of is there something that i should really be paying attention to that uh, may be at risk i i want to know that i'm going to be safe, I believe I'm in inherently safe, but I'm not going to just run away from the fear. I want to understand the fear. I don't want it to limit me. I want it to inform me and then pull back to the loving intent. Doubt is an invitation back to faith and confidence in yourself. And worry is an invitation to bring you back to the presence, to the gratitude of the moment. So if you look at these uh, and jot them down, if you will, as uh, fear, doubt, and worry, love, faith, and gratitude, put a line across them. This is kind of a way of orienting yourself back on course, but not to make the fear, doubt, and worry wrong, but to embrace it as part of the, the, of the, the communication you're getting from your soul so that you can clear that stuff up if that it makes sense. Thank you. I think there's a question in there, Cindy. Um, yeah, that was, you know, I love that, John. I love the visual of fear, doubt, worry. And then on the other side of that, love, faith. I put intent, but I like gratitude, you know. Um, so that was an excellent explanation. Chelsea writes, um, 
what you describe about emotions and thoughts really makes sense. And it reminds um, her of the book, The Four Agreements. Um, and it shares the same guidance and, and inviting all the experiences in, and not just, you know, good and, not labeling them good and bad. So, Miguel um, Ruiz, uh, with The Four Agreements, if I'm not, not mistaken, um, it's a, a book that goes way back to one of the ones that I was digesting adversely. <laughs> I very much appreciate uh, what, uh, that uh, that offers the four agreements very powerful. Yeah, and then can you repeat the uh, fear, doubt, and worry again with the sure. love, faith? Just yeah, sure. Because uh, you mentioned intent uh, uh, to um, Cindy. I, I look at when I say love, uh, I'm talking about the love, the passion, purpose, love, and benefits of your intention. So. When you're in fear, you can move back to your loving intent. So fear moves an invitation to love, back to love. Um, the um, doubt is a back to an invitation uh, to have uh, that kind of uh, faith in yourself and something higher. When we talk about faith in yourself, it's, it's, it really is something uh, to recognize that we have a lot of strengths. And a lot of times we're looking at our deficits. When we redirect attention regularly to, the, to our strengths, we build confidence. And every day I ask people to look for successes. And I ask myself to reflect on my own successes because the more I acknowledge my successes, the more my confidence builds. That's another thing about successes is that people think they have to be some huge success. Whereas, just coming to a call like this is a success. You've made a choice to invest in yourself and improve your conditions for your benefit and the benefit of others. That's a success. So love, faith, and gratitude aligns with uh, or, or the invitations that when fear, doubt, and worry show up. So that's, uh, those are the parallels, fear, to love-based intent. Doubt to faith in yourself, perhaps something higher. And um, uh, worry to pull yourself back to the present and be grateful for the moment. And there's so much to be grateful for when we direct our attention there. So um, hopefully that's clear. Okay. All right. Now hop back here. I'm getting better at Zoom manipulating. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Just to make some distinctions between intentions and goals. As I say, meaningful intentions are filled with passion, purpose, love, and benefits for all. Goals often are absent of this kind of context, of uh, the richness of of uh, intention. Uh, goals are often very, um, very much uh, intellectual. And uh, it's important for our intentions to hold real value for us, real sense of purpose, uh, real sense of uh, loving intent. Intentions are flexible, where goals are rigid. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're all familiar with goals, right? You set a goal and then you work toward the goal. And uh, you'll often hear people say, I have to stay focused on my goal. The goals, um, it's all about the goal. And I'm not really comfortable with that idea because there may be deeper needs that are to be met. You establish an intention you don't stay force, forcing yourself on, the, the, on making anything happen. You're remaining sensitive to the, your deepest desires and urges. And when you get into the process of playing with your intention, you start to get, become more informed from your soul of who you are, of uh, what genuinely you feel um, that are more aligned with as we would talk about uh, love, faith, and gratitude we may discover deeper needs that we want to meet. I often think of a, a 90 day game player who came with a, a business intention 
And in the process of that, and she started as we today, with it, we'll be doing the five jump start questions and formulating an intention. She began with that intention. But in the process of having a conversation with her soul, she discovered that she really wanted to be a mom. And in that awareness, realized that she needed to really do some uh, interesting work with her husband because they were not really on the same page and getting along very well. So she shifted to that intention to reconcile uh, uh, her relationship with her husband. And then she moved in the direction of becoming a mom. And it was a beautiful thing to see. You see, because intellectually she came to the, in, initially with this idea of I wanna make more money in my business. How am I gonna do that? But by having a conversation with a soul, she realized I have a deeper need that I want to meet. Now, I hope you could see that if she set out on a goal to create more money in her business, she may have completely bypassed what she truly deeply wanted. And what a wonderful mother this woman is. And I, I can't say enough. Uh, I was so thrilled to get my first picture from her <laughs> of her baby who is now uh, not a baby, I think it's some nine or 10 years later, but she's such a wonderful mother. It was her soul's code. It was in the blueprint. She was meant to express this. So intentions are flexible. What we do today will evolve and you should not feel at all um, restricted by it. Uh, or feel any sense of force that you have to make it happen. You could tear it right up and start again. You could evolve it, you will evolve it by redirecting your attention on your intention, staying in conversation with your soul. So goals are rigid, intentions are flexible, and we want you to remain open and receptive for that possibility or something better. Just as this woman I uh, mentioned uh, absolutely did beautifully. The other thing you'll notice about setting a goal is that it has very little to do with the present, doesn't it? You set a goal, you make a certain amount of money, um, a meet an individual, uh, or lose so much weight or whatever. It's always something that you're projecting to tomorrow where intentions are supremely process oriented and in the present. It's movement in the present. It has an idea of the kinds of uh, intentional outcomes we want, but you're supremely involved in the present. And that'll be a refinement step that we'll cover to it. Because goals are always so future-based, it's almost like happiness doesn't happen until I get the goal. And what happens once you get the goal? You may be thrilled for a fleeting amount of time, <laughs> or you may uh, just completely uh, remain empty, uh, not feeling satisfied. And even if you achieve the goal, there's another one right behind it. And there you are setting an intention, uh, a goal for tomorrow. I never re really having the opportunity to revel in the joy of the moment and the joy of creation. And in the process, all we have is the present. Tomorrow is an illusion. It's an idea. Yesterday is something that was. All we have is now. So why not enjoy now? Why not revel in the process of creation? So no shoulds allowed. If you have a different feeling, if you want to move in another direction, allow yourself to move in that direction. That's the richness of having a conversation with yourself. Helping you remain uh, true to what is, as opposed to what well, you think you should be doing, or what your family or friends think you sh should be doing, or what society expects from you. There's a lot of social hypnosis to get past. Everybody wants to feel accepted with their tribes. This is always the case. And by wanting to be accepted with your tribe, sometimes you don't allow yourself to be who you are. 
But when we allow ourselves to be who we truly are, we organize and attract people and, and situations that are in alignment with who we truly are. And we could cultivate our, our so-called tribes <laughs> and uh, who are on the same page. So your soul knows what's best for you. And you'll become aware of what's best for you. And oddly enough, you, we may not know. Well, but we have some glimpses. And I think the structure of having faith and connection with our soul, the source of all there is that gave us this life, we can get guidance there and continue to move and evolve in that direction in the precious present moment. Any uh, questions, comments, or thoughts about um, uh, this, uh, these distinctions uh, between intentions and, and goals? I like to pause every so often and, and even for di some digestion of <laughs> what was said could be helpful. Okay. Back to the next topic. Alrighty folks, it's time to create. And we'll use what is um, to, to create this initial draft. We start with five jumpstart questions. And these jumpstart questions, you're going to be uh, encouraged to invest two minutes of time. Why only two minutes? because we want to get some intuitive response. We don't want to get the rational mind involved with what's possible, what can be. Uh, the rational mind will restrict, quickly restrict what's possible. We want to remain open uh, to the uh, richness. Uh, like Carl Jung said, the, play, the debt we owe to the play of ima imagination is incalculable. Uh, allow yourself to play with fantasy. Uh, allow yourself to really just um, um, let your soul's intuition express itself. Um, I refer to my buddy Al quite often. I have a personal relationship with Albert Einstein. That's always been uh, my, my uh, one of my uh, buddies in my uh, subconscious uh, mind. <laughs> more my inner conscious mind, as Jose Silva prefers, we say. And um, he said, and it, quite frankly, it was a paraphrase. I'm very fussy about quotations, so I'll say it was a paraphrase by someone who uh, uh, wrote a book about Einstein. The sentiment is there, and I'm certain knowing enough about uh, Einstein's points of view that this was valid. He said, um, the in intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And we've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. So when we talk about the faithful servant, uh, we don't say uh, disparage it. It's a faithful servant. But what comes first is the sacred gift, uh, the sacred gift of intuition. Uh, if you look at it from a, a left brain, right brain analogy, you might say that we create a vision with the right brain and we allow that play of fantasy, those ideas, those visions to come from the right brain. And then we use the left brain or the faithful servant to organize and implement that vision. So there's an orderliness to it where we open up for inspiration, we get inspiration, then we organize it and we implement. And too often we put the faithful servant at the helm, the rational mind that kind of doesn't really know anything other than what it already knows. 
And so the rational mind's forever kind of pushing around um, already known quantities where the intuitive mind's opened up to new insights, fresh information that dawns on us. So I'm inviting you here in the two minutes for each of these questions to allow yourself to be guided by the sacred gift of intuition. There'll be plenty of time to organize and employ. So are you ready to do the right thing? Because we're going to go and step into uh, jumpstart question one. And it's a big one. What do you want to create? That's a big one. <laughs> but this is where the soul's urge is. So I'm going to um, go with two minutes of silence and allow you to um, enjoy uh, jotting down your response to this first question. And remember, it's just a draft. So don't worry about doing it just right. Be a child and play with it. Okay, just about 30 seconds more. Okay. All right, folks. Get ready. We're moving to question number two. <laughs> Here we go. What is motivating you to create this? Like in terms of what needs may be driving you, what values may be orienting you? Again, let's allow for two minutes. I'll be silent.
about another 20 seconds or so. Okay, and um, it will be helpful to write the questions down as well, if you haven't done so, because you'll want may want to revisit this uh, these five questions. Uh, so um, we have um, the first big question was what do I want to create? So if you would, might want to jot that down above what you wrote for in your response there, and this. Uh, one we just completed. What is motivating me to create this? Okay, so we're going to move on to the third of five jumpstart questions. And that is, what talents and strengths do I have that align with my intention? So you want to, might, might want to write that down before uh, you start to respond to it. What talents and strengths do I have that align with my intention? And please allow yourself to connect with your talents and strengths. So often we're not, we've been conditioned not to think about ourselves as talented or strong. <laughs> you should be thinking of others. So that's the question. And remember, you're not alone. You have divine guidance. You have the talents of other souls. Right now, jot down a few of your own talents and strengths that align with your intention. I will give you time for this. Okay, about uh, 20 seconds or so. Okay, very good. All righty, folks. Here comes the next one, number four of five. Why is creating this valuable to me? Again, jot down that one, do the right thing, and uh, write this one down. Why is creating this valuable to me? You know, things that are valuable to us, we tend to stick with. And if something's not valuable to us, then maybe uh, that's not exactly what we want. So I will again uh, ask the question, why is creating this valuable to me? And feel free to do the right thing. Again, I will give you time for this.
Okay, about 15 seconds or so. Okay. And now the last, the fifth question. How will I and others benefit from my creation? And put yourself first, please. So often we put ourselves last and we never get to ourselves. So how will I and others benefit from my creation? And know that when you benefit, others naturally will benefit. Okay, about 15 seconds or so. All right, folks, here you have it, the five jumpstart questions. And you've got yourself an opportunity to have a, a, an initial draft here, your intention statement. And um, just pause for a moment here. Any comments or questions? Uh, you know, in 10 minutes, you formulated your first go of this. And there's some refinement steps I want to talk about. Uh, that will give you a, a sense that you have your first full draft. But I just thought I'd pause to see if there's any questions or comments in the moment. All right. Very good. I would like to go over some... Uh, there we go some uh, refinement steps. So here's something uh, to jot down so you could play with this a little later. Uh, refinement step one is to state what you want, not what you don't want. And you might want to jot that down because this would be a little bit of a field work for you <laughs> to play with beyond the call. And maybe while we're talking about this topic, as well. So I make certain uh, you will refine your responses with the uh, 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 writing down what you want, not what you don't want. So examples would be, I want to lose weight, quit my dreadful job, uh, get out of debt, no longer be lonely. And it's not uncommon when we first express what we want, that a lot of stuff we don't want shows up in the statement. So we want to orient our minds to what we want. Um, what do we want? Do we really want to lose weight, for example, or do we want to um, uh, be healthy? 
Are we uh, be comfortable in our bodies? Uh, you know, what, what is it that we want as opposed to what we don't want? Quitting our dreadful job? Maybe not. Uh, maybe it's about fulfilling work, some sense of, uh, of engaging occupation. A lot of times people are right to uh, want to get out of debt. Well, I think maybe some of uh, financial freedom might be the way we would want to reorganize that. And we could, uh, you know, interact around this in a moment if you like, but that's, that's the idea that I, I wanted to share with you on refinement step one. And there's uh, two more refinement steps. And Refinement step two is to rephrase your responses in a present moment context. Now, what does that mean? Well, a lot of times we'll say, I want this and I want that. And uh, uh, it, it's inherently, it brings us to tomorrow. Where this refinement step rephrasing your responses in a present moment context means that you're going to go over each of your responses and see where you can put things like, instead of I want a wonderful uh, new career as an example, it might be I am taking steps to create a wonderful career uh, as an example. I am taking steps to um, move in the direction of this or that. Or I am creating better and better health. So you'll find when you put an I am, an I am statement, which is probably the most powerful statement you can make with uh, three little letters, I am creating is powerful. And it's followed, usually followed by a, an ing word, I am creating. I am to, uh, you know, moving, I, you know, there's movements, there's, you're back oriented into the present. I am taking steps. Now, sometimes uh, we might say, I am learning to, because maybe there's some, uh, that's a bridge to the I am, uh, it's actually taking those steps. So um, a lot of the responses uh, for, to the Jumpstart questions might be oriented in a way where it's not present oriented, but future oriented. And we wanna bring it into a present moment context. And we could um, discuss that if that's not clear in a moment. And the last one, well, what you'll be doing is dropping away the questions and streaming together your responses into one flowing statement. And that is, uh, that makes it a complete uh, first draft. When you drop away the questions, you try to kind of flow it into a narrative, into a conversation. And so um, you're encouraged to write and rewrite and continue to do the right thing because each time you scratch something out and you put something of greater clarity in or you modify the statement in any way, you're really uh, dynamically interacting. You're having that conversation. With a goal, you don't do that. With a goal, you put it, uh, put it down, you, that's it, the goal's established now, hunker down. Focus, get it done. It's a very different orientation. So we want to uh, okay. want to say, um, you now have your first intention statement draft, and the word draft is underlined. When you think you have your statement perfect, it's just beautiful, it resonates, it feels fantastic. And now you say, okay, I'm done. This is it. Well, if, that, if you say that, then you know that you've gone off course. Because <laughs> that means you've stopped the growth and the movement. We wanna, we 
continue to have the conversation. There's always room for refinement because you're going to be taking action. You're going to be taking steps. You're going to be enjoying creating this creation process. Things are going to change because you are by virtue of the fact that you're engaged in the creation process. So you're always going to throw in a wonderful success, a new shift, a new awareness, a fresh and empowering belief. And ultimately your intention statement becomes a statement of gratitude. John, um, somebody just asked if you can put the last slide up or repeat the last slide. Oh, okie doke. Go back over there to the screen share. And see. Okay, and back one. Okay, that's refinement step three. Is that correct? Yeah, let's uh, quickly recap those. So we have uh, moving from what we want, that urge, that desire, and that longing for what's missing to what's available. And to step into that which we want. Step two, re rephrase your responses in the present moment context. So what I want is always something I don't have now. So we want, if we're aware of what we don't want and we're aware that we don't have it, we want to acknowledge I'm in the process of creating it. I am creating. And the third one, where you just Free yourself from the questions and you stream together your responses into one flowing statement and you've got yourself your first draft. Okay, I will, let's see, here we go. And well, I'm back here on the fifth. And so, uh, questions, comments, curiosities, wonderment, <laughs> what have you to say here, thinking, uh, how can I help? John, uh, somebody asks, what is the difference between question two and question four? And um, her answers are quite the same. Yeah, that and that's okay. Yes, good, good. Oh, there's someone that's playing <laughs> to notice that. Uh, it, it's it is uh, essentially um, orienting around motivation, and also what we value a great deal. It's valuable to us, and that is often shows up uh, in, in very similar ways. But sometimes asking the same question a little differently draws out more. So a way I found that when I, in reviewing, I don't know, hundreds, if not thousands of intention statements, that it's uh, useful for people to orient around motivation and also to orient around the values, what they find valuable. Sometimes a little murky when I say, you know, say, what, what are your values? You know, it's a little difficult for people to really grasp what a value is. So I like looking at, at values as what's valuable uh, to you, and um, you know, so hopefully that's uh, will offer some uh, clarity there. But uh, you're right; it's often similar, uh, and that's that's a demonstration when that happens. Of there's some some clarity there, so definite clarity about what you want. What else comes to mind? Any other comments, questions? John, two things that stood out for me is one is uh, not, focusing, not focusing on what you don't want, because that's really easy for our brain to go into, here's what I don't want. So changing that to what we actually do want. And then the second part is uh, putting it in the present moment. 
because if it's all, if it's a want or something that is in the future, it'll always seem to stay in the future. But uh, your intention statements are about, like you said, enjoying today and enjoying that now and, and um, creating that in the present moment. In the process, in creating, in the moment, absolutely. That's it. And, you know, of course, uh, knowing what you don't want informs you of what you do want. Um, uh, noticing what's missing is an invitation to meet that need. So um, again, no good, bad, right, wrong, but uh, uh, in the, or I should say, and <laughs> more than a but, that we want to direct attention on what we want to create because if the attention is on what's missing, we get more context of what's missing. That's then naturally how our brains operate. Uh, when we have an, uh, an, an attention on our intention of what we are creating, uh, we get a different kind of mind map going in our, in our consciousness. But it's perfectly natural, as you say, the tendency is there uh, to look at what's missing because uh, a lot of what uh, drives us is our survival mechanism. We're always on alert. We want to be safe. So uh, uh, there's a natural inclination is everything okay is everything anything you know out or missing or what's you know i want to feel grounded in the known and uh, it's not unusual to, to feel that pull toward uh, uh you know what's missing what's off what's not really there you know so uh that's it uh and and, and also also i should say um we don't control things. We have command over how we're appraising things, how we're viewing things, but we don't control everything. So not everything's going to unfold and we shouldn't anticipate that everything's gonna unfold. Uh, if just, I have this clear intention, now everything's gonna be rosy. We'll have that interplay of, of confliction. And that's not a bad thing. It's, it gives us more to dig in deeper to, and we just continue to pull back, refine and align, and that's the way the process goes. So uh, this is not a magic pill. Now everything's going to be perfect, because in effect, everything is perfect. It's how we perceive things. So I use an expression um, to seek perfection within the perceived imperfection, because it is just a perception. There's perfection going on. And sometimes we try to force and push things in a particular direction when maybe something uh, better is uh, calling us, something more important is calling us. So there's, uh, uh, again, that acceptance of what is, not trying to force right, wrong orientation, good, bad orientation, but taking it all as divine guidance information. It's all valuable. So that leads us to to actually a, a question, which is actually perfect. Um, I feel I so Meg asks. I feel and I tried to cover too much territory in one question. Everything I want to create is not just one thing, like getting a better job. How do we focus on the most important intention and not too much, or do we need to focus down on just one thing? Sure. Um, I think this is something you, if you return to this statement and the intention with this is to revisit it, I say about four to five times a week. More frequently, if you care to, if you're naturally drawn to, it. but we don't want to get obsessive about this. But at the same time, we want to keep the conversation going. So uh, through the years, it seems that uh, settled upon a kind of nice rhythm, four to five days a week, uh, revisit your intention state and you'll start to see what is more uh, potent for you, what you're drawn more to. I mean, one intention is to have a little bit more balancing. So there may be a number of things in someone's intention statement. If that's what they're after, to have that kind of balance, fine. Uh, but it, you, it could be someone that's eager to create a lot of stuff. And so aim to see what pulls you most potently. Refine your statement around that. You, if the other things are important to you, they're not gonna leave you. And, and if you feel comfortable, 
capture them in the written form and aim to refine your intention statement to that which is most valuable, most potent for you in the moment. If that's helpful. Um, just quickly up, oh, let's see, it's up. Oh, I see a thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and everyone. Uh, let's see. I just go back here for a moment. Um, kind of returning to these three manifestation steps. I mentioned them before. What we just, I like to think we've begun as a conversation with your soul that will establish clear intent. Then, as I say, four to five days a week, pull your attention back toward your intention. And again, navigate the peaks and valleys with a, a, awareness that it's all valuable information. Um, not to over-dramatize, become an alert witness and create some space between the, 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 the valleys and pull them back to the op uh, opportunities to create uh, you know, more uh, peaks going forward. Um, let's see. I think what I'd like to do, just to give you some opportunity here. Let me go over and share this screen. I think I have it up here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Okay, now, let's see if I can get back to the Zoom. I'd like to get you over to the 90 day game page. I'm able to get that going. Here we are. So let's do a screen share over to, let's see, where is it on the screen? Yeah, I guess this may be screen two. Let's see if I got any luck here on this. Come back to where I was. I mean, we could. Yeah, let's see if we can get on the screen. Okay, so stop that. Share again. And here we are. Thanks for your patience on this. And with any luck, we'll get you there. Okay. What well, do you see? A web page? Uh, yeah, 90daygame.com. Oh, okay. Uh, Yes, yes, because uh, my other screen is still showing me the slideshow, which is fine. I want to get back to that. Uh, I'm going to just scroll down here, um, and uh, you can access the 90daygame.com, and we talk about uh, directing attention on your intention. I use these things are called mind games. They're mental exercises, and um, you can mentally rehearse your intention. Uh, you can mentally rehearse, uh, uh, rather, uh, you could bring an abundant mindset of gratitude and successes to mind. If you need a little bit more, uh, in, stimulate a little more intuition, there's this BMW mind game. There's a bunch of different things you can do accessing this audio. It's probably not going to make a great deal of sense, some of them, in terms of language being used, if you don't have the game book. So uh, if you're interested in going further into uh, beyond, um, well, I should, should say, as you're developing this and creating what you want, there's different tools you can access uh, on, the, on the website. And it's helpful to have the book to have context. The book's available um, in a written form. It, it, uh, it's kind of chunky. Uh, 
it's it's also in uh, on Audible. So if you have Audible, you can use one of your uh, uh, tokens or whatever they call these things these days uh, to pick up the uh, audio book. And the audio book has the playbook, which has all the forms and stuff of the game. And also on this screen, this principles, which is also game pieces of the uh, that we have here, that each day will kind of suggest that you pick a principle and see how it relates to your intention. So there's 10 principles. And when you kind of uh, refresh the screen, it's nice to look for them to come up spontaneously and think about how this principle applies. Right now, it makes sense to me that it's in the present moment because we're together and uh, that's the whole idea of uh, intention statements to be in the present moment. So if uh, you go to 90daygame.com, you can access these things. You, uh, to get to this page, it's usually for the players page. So you'd have to log in as a player um, and that's easy enough to do. Uh, it, it'll ask you, you know, where you got the book. If you didn't get the book, you didn't get the book. But if you did, you, you, you fill that in. But there's nothing stopping you from getting into this page if you want to get in there. Just uh, need to log in for it. And uh, on this page, well, you can see there's a companion video uh, piece you can pick up on. Here's the book and the uh, there's audio on CD if you prefer CDs to MP3s or online. Principal cards come in hard copy. You can get a bunch of these things. So you could uh, browse the site and see, um, you know, uh, what uh, uh, may appeal to you. And, uh, and uh, that could help you develop uh, your intention all the more. Now, let's, let's see if I can save so long to that. Um, am I off the screen share? Yep. Okay, good. So I'm now just uh, happy to uh, hang out with you folks. So I'll put this, I uh, uh, guess I should, uh, you know, 90daygame.com. If you just put John at uh, before it, you can communicate with me. If there are any questions or comments you have, if you want to share your intention drafts, I'm happy to receive them. Uh, by sharing them with others, they actually increase some uh, power there. So uh, I would invite you to do that as well if you'd like. Happy to have any other questions or comments uh, before we say so long. I realize I've done a good job of absorbing all the time. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it went by fast. This was absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Um, John, if you don't mind sticking around, maybe what we'll do is we'll end the call. Um, I know Judy's got a, a poem uh, and we'll end. However, if you can stick around, if anybody has any questions just for a few minutes, that would be great. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And thank you everyone for, for, uh, for being here. I hope you participated and, and wrote down your intention statement. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have Judy close us out and then please stick around if you have questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. It was great. You're getting a lot of people thanking you so, so much. Um, we always end, Sunlight Spirits always ends their Zoom events with a poem. And this one is, and a lot of people might know this one, but it is Mary Ann Williamson, Our Deepest Fear. Um, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be? Brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So that's that. And if anybody has questions. Yeah, so thank you, Judy. That is one of my favorite poems. Um, thank you, John. Like, yeah, this was just, and I've heard this before, but it always just, it makes such a huge impact. So um, if anybody wants to you know, ask a question, don't worry about the chat, just unmute. So that's a smaller yeah but this was thank you uh, i have to leave 
Thank you very much, John. It was a real pleasure. Oh, Franz, so good to see you again. <laughs> it's been very long. Bye-bye. I'm glad that you got some value.